Do you think you can put a number on the amount of species you've seen in your life? Absolutely not. Just stepping out onto the city street, there are countless species around us at all times. It's a huge amount of biodiversity. But what does that even mean, and how do we study it? This week on Radio Bio, we are joined by Dr. Felipe Zafada from University of California, Los Angeles, to discuss just that. This is Radio Bio. Don't know much biology. Hello, and welcome to Radio Bio. I'm your host, Jackie Shea. And I'm Lily Pennington. Today, we are chatting with Dr. Felipe Zapata from the University of California in Los Angeles. Welcome, Felipe. Hi. (laughs) Thanks for having me. Uh, So can we start by you telling us what your research interests are? Sure. So um, I am basically a plant evolutionary biologist with uh, really broad interests in trying to understand what the origins and evolution of plant biodiversity, meaning that I am interested in nature and understanding what species exist in nature and how these species form and how these species evolve and they are related to each other. So what are you hoping to discover by doing this research? So one of my main goals, uh, especially coming from the tropics, so I am originally from, from Colombia, is that we know very little about um, biodiversity in some uh, places in the tropics. And w- w- there's still a lot of plants and animals and bacteria and biodiversity that is unknown. So one of my main sort of research interests and goals is try to discover new species and discover biodiversity but also trying to understand how these species uh, evolve and what processes led to the evolution and formation of new species. So part of what I am really hoping to understand is not only what biodiversity we have in nature, but also how that biodiversity form and what are the processes that led to the evolution of those uh, species. What is biodiversity anyway? Biodiversity is an important concept in nature It's a relatively new concept, first introduced in 1985, that refers to the variety of life on Earth on the level of genes, species, and communities. The more we explore ecosystems and discover new species, the more we learn from the wisdom of millions of years of evolution that has contributed to the unique balance of life we get to enjoy today. So studying biodiversity, even just describing a new species, can help us all understand and appreciate what makes human life possible. Wow, it's like a science history, a history of species. Yeah, it's like detective work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's basically, yeah, basically what I do, it's um, uh, sort of historical biology in many ways. So I try to reconstruct the evolutionary history of a species, but I do a lot of uh, discovery uh, in t- instead of uh, uh, in terms of going out in nature and looking for new stuff that people haven't seen or that they are there, but we haven't uh, documented new species. So part of what I do is discovery, and also uh, analysis of the history of those species. So you're an explorer of the Mm -hmm. natural world. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. That's basically what it is. I try to explain to some people that what I do is kind of like a a Darwin Mm. approach with new technologies, trying to go in nature, make observations about how species look, what species do in nature, and then use new technologies to understand their evolution and their uh, origins. Wow. So as you're studying biodiversity, you know, I kind of hear this word in lots of different capacities, biodiversity, biodiversity. Why, in your opinion, is it important to explore biodiversity, explain it, and try to understand the history of it today? You know, mm-hmm. what role does biodiversity play in, in, the sci- in science today? Well, um, as a plant biologist, um, I believe that plants are so fundamental for everything. I mean, we couldn't be here without plants. Plants produce also oxygen. Plants uh, give us food, give us shelter. So I think that understanding at least plant biodiversity is really fundamental because there are so many species out there and so many organisms that basically run the world and we perhaps don't know much about them. And with all this, I mean, like currently, with all these changes in climate and all these um, changes in sort of human behavior that we are uh, interacting more and more with the environment, we can be um, harming uh, some pristine areas or some species that we 
don't even understand how they work and maybe they are so fundamental for keeping the whole ecosystem together and by losing those we might be losing complete ecosystems and we don't even know that that could happen so i think that understanding about diversity and and still going out there and looking for random plants and random organisms is so fundamental to to be connected to nature and have that understanding that organisms are connected to each other and they can sort of provide us with uh, food and shelter and stuff that, that we otherwise we wouldn't have. So you mentioned using technologies earlier. What exactly are those technologies that you're using today and why is that adding or how is that contributing more to this field of science than it used to be in the past when we didn't have those types of technologies? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, as part of my my research, as I mentioned, one of my interests is trying to understand the history of a species and understanding how they evolve and how they are related to each other. This has been uh, going on for many years. Many people have been interested in these questions and since, I don't know, Victorian, Victorian times or even before that, people were asking about how animals and plants were related to each other. Uh, and people were, at those times, were mainly using morphological information. So they were looking at the, at the uh, organisms and making inferences about how they could be related based on how similar they look. Um, and that's a great way to do it. Uh, now we have access to, for example, genetic data, and we can uh, make inferences about the history based on the genes that they share, genes that they are that they are that are inherited um, through generations. More recently, we got access to full genomes and full transcriptomes, and basically we are we are being able finally to crack the whole um, code of um, the genes that underlie species differences, but also species similarities, and having access to technologies like uh, new sequencing technologies new computational tools for analyzing all these big data sets. In terms of morphology, having access to big databases of morphological information, that's basically changing all what we used to do in the past. Okay, so we often talk about new technologies and how much they have changed biological research, but what are these technologies? Well, we're all made up of DNA comprising of A's, C's, T's, and G's, which form a unique code that carry the genetic instructions for just about everything, right? What's really cool is that we've been able to not only identify those codes, but read them like a book. But this is all still relatively new. When we sequenced the first human genome back in 2001, it cost about $1 billion and took 13 years to complete. Today, it costs about $3,000 to $5,000 and takes just one to two days. Wow, we've come a long way. No wonder it's so useful today. Now we have access to so much information, so much data, that it's uh, helping us to make new discoveries about new relationships that we didn't expect before, but also providing us with way more data than we could even had before. So some of those changes are the changes that, that um, uh, are having a big effect in my field in systematics and evolutionary biology. And we use some of those in my lab. We are doing now genomics. We are trying to do some big databases of morphology and trying to use these technologies to understand better nature. So you mentioned new discoveries. Is there a new discovery that you've made that's really excited you? Well, it's exciting to me that I have discovered new species. That's kind of exciting to me. Yeah, uh, that's really exciting. <laughs> uh, nobody cares about the plants that I study. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's exciting when you sort of find something that is new, that is like nobody has seen it before, or maybe was there, but nobody saw it and realized that it's a new species. So to me, that's really exciting uh, to find new species. Also, I have made some contributions to understand better re relationships of organisms that we knew in the past. So I did some work um, before, before starting uh, my job at UCLA, uh, working with animals, for example. And there has been some major questions about relationships of major groups of animals, especially in, in vertebrates that has been a, a big puzzle uh, and a big question in biology because some of those animals haven't left a uh, fossil record. Some of these relationships happened so long ago, more than 200 million years ago or something wow. like that. So it's really, really old, and we don't understand exactly how some of those organisms evolved. So by using some of these new technologies and genomics, we were able to propose uh, new relationships that are holding and sort of make sense when you look at the animals it sort of makes sense that, that some groups are related to each other, not in the past people as the people thought. So even though that's not like a discovery in the sense of like 
discovering something completely new. People knew about those relationships, but it wasn't clear how they were related. With new technologies, we were able to sort of find it out and sort of provide a, a strong answer to those relationships. And how does that change our understanding of these species? Like, if you think, you know, these two things <clears throat> that look alike are really closely related, but now it turns out they're not, like, what does that mean for us? Yeah, that's also a great question because um, part of our interest as, as, as evolutionary biologists on reconstructing the history of life is that we are not only interested in relationships, we're also interested in the processes that led to the evolution of the uh, organisms that you see today. So if we see organisms that look alike, we might wonder why they look alike and why uh, they behave the same way. Are the same genes? Are the same, uh, they look alike because they are sister to each other? Or they look alike because evolution has used the same mechanisms to produce the same morphologies? So once um, we discover these relationships, some of our hypotheses about how organisms work and how organisms behave can completely change depending on these relationships. So imagine that if you, in the past, people thought that for whatever reason, these two animals or these two plants were sister to each other because they look very similar, but now after doing all this analysis, you discover that actually they are not related to each other. That means very likely that they look the same because they converge into the same morphologies. So that opens the door for us biologists to start wondering what is the underlying mechanism of that convergence? So we can look into the genes, into the physiologies, their anatomy, and try to understand how they come to the same solution, if you wish, for the same sort of ecological problem. So that's how uh, understanding relationships can really change our understanding of, of biology. Wow, this is all really cool. And I <laughs> love examples. So do you have like an example of organisms that like look really similar but are not like related? Um, oh my god. <laughs> Sorry to look, put you on the spot. <laughs> um, well, in, I mean, in the plant world, there are so many um, plant species um, that look very similar. For example, uh, uh, something that happened recently, relatively recently, maybe a few years ago, there's this really crazy little uh, aquatic plant um, called... Um, Hydatella, the family Hydatellaceae. Uh, people, they look, they have basically lost most of their traits in the flowers, uh, very similar to what grasses have done. So grasses is a big group of plants and they also have very simple morphology in terms of the flowers. So the flowers look nothing like a typical flower. They don't have flashy petals, they don't have flashy colors, but they still have all the tissues that a flower has. This other plant also look very similar as a, like, a, like a grass morphology. People knew that they were not grasses, but they were look, looking kind of the same like a grass. So for many years, people put them closely related to grasses. Uh, people knew that they were weird, but they were there. And recently, people um, discovered that actually they are not. They are super far away from the grasses. They are actually one of the um, sort of relatives to the early branches of the angiosperms. And they are so bizarre and so different is because they are aquatic. So when they sort of transition into aquatic habitats, the morphology change, and that's the hypothesis that we have, and the morphology change completely. So now the flowers look very similar, very simple as a flower of a grass, but they are completely different organisms, and they are, don't have, I mean, they are not related to grasses at all. I mean, there are so many other plants that are closely to grasses than these plants are, but the morphology is very, very similar. Okay, so before we had all of this cool sequencing technology, we mostly identified and named new species based on the way they look. This helped us categorize things and built our understanding of the world around us. But when we started sequencing things, we were surprised to see a lot of our guesses were good, but not right. This example is cool because it helped us understand that this plant is related to a totally different group of plants than what just looking at it would suggest, giving us a better understanding of its evolutionary history and ecology. So these are kind of, a, to me, is one of the cl classic examples of why morphology, people using morphological data or morphological observations made good guesses and had this hypothesis about, okay, these organisms look the same because they perhaps lost the same genes or they lost the same um, properties. But now we know that something really bizarre happened to this branch that colonized water and many changes have happened and grasses later on in evolution evolved into the same kind of morphology. It's really cool what you do because 
it's in a lot of ways you're really clarifying and confirming a lot of things that we thought we knew as people and scientists but we were only making these guesses like you were saying and now we can kind of like no no this is what it is and this is what the relationships are and this is what we now understand from it so in a lot of ways it's like you're cleaning up a lot of our understanding of, <laughs> of evolutionary biology which is really cool what sort of got you interested in this field in the first place i mean how did you get to where you are today yeah that's that's a great question too so as i mentioned i am originally from colombia from the tropics and i grew up uh, in a city, of course, but um, I was surrounded by nature the whole time. So I used to travel a lot in Colombia, and Colombia is a really biodiverse country. So I was uh, traveling the mountains and going to uh, the lowlands and going to different forest types. And I was al always puzzled about all these plants and all these organisms and how this is happening and where do they come from and how they evolve here and why they look different in different mountain ranges. and. You have some species in the lowlands that they are not in the highlands. So I was always puzzled about how biodiversity evolved and how biodiversity really originated and why Colombia or the tropics are so diverse versus other places in the world. So that get me um, that got me starting to thinking about uh, evolution and sort of nature. And when I went to college, also in Colombia, I learn about evolution in my evolution classes and I was amazed that like, oh my God, this is like a natural, like processes, natural processes produce all these things, this is crazy. Uh, but I didn't know exactly how to um, try to do it, try to understand it. And then I took a class in systematics or phylogenetics and that was amazing because that class showed me how to use information from the organisms themselves to reconstruct potentially their evolutionary histories and then test hypotheses about potentially how those organisms evolve and where they come from and how they um, evolve in different places. So to me, that was like the perfect moment to combine my passion for evolution with a tool that also provided a lot of information for reconstructing the history of life. And I became obsessed with, with systematics and evolutionary biology. And as an undergrad, I was the whole time working in the herbarium, trying to understand plants and working in the field, collecting plants and trying to understand how they were um, uh, related to each other, using morphological information. And then I was able to sort of come to the States to do my PhD. And yeah, I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. You sort of, you were like raised in the environment that, and you were just inspired by it. Mm -hmm. And that's really amazing. So I, um, I love herbaria, and I don't know if our listeners necessarily know what that is or why it's important to keep them around, because I know that that's something that's been talked about yeah. a lot lately. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a really a really good question too. So um, herbaria are basically libraries of um, dry plants, if you wish. So basically, it's a collection of um, specimens coming from nature, from samples that people go and collect different branches of trees or whole plants. They dry them out. They write down a lot of information from the field, where the plant was collected, uh, information that they see that is going to be likely lost through time, like colors, if they see any interactions with other organisms, the exact place where the plant is growing, if it's, I don't know, on top of another tree, on the, on the ground, n near to water, whatever. So you make all these notes. And then you dry these plants. Uh, there are different ways to dry the plants. And you just flat them out and basically stick them to a piece of paper and you store them. Uh, and if the herbarium is well preserved, these samples can be forever, for a long, long time. And then anybody can just go back. And if you're interested in a group of plants or a region, you can just go back to the herbarium and open these cabinets and start finding all these plants that many people have collected before. Uh, and you can get information about how these plants look or species that were at some point in a region, but now there's not anymore. They don't grow there anymore. So you can get all that information. We've been collecting specimens in herbaria for centuries, and it's a great resource for geological and morphological data. And nowadays, we can sequence DNA from these specimens, providing direct genetic evidence of evolution through time and space. And I think that the herbaria and museums in general, I mean, you can do the same for animals. You have uh, insects, you can have mammals, you can have all the different organisms in museums, in museum collections. And I think that those are very 
fundamental um, pieces of, of uh, knowledge for biologists. Um, I'm a strong sort of defender of the natural history collections. I believe that they are critical for biology because they provide all this raw information that you cannot get uh, and you cannot go to every single place in the world, but people have been there. So you can combine information from other places, you can ask loans and go to different herbaria, different museums and sort of start looking at this information, but also provide us with data that it's is likely um, not gonna be there forever. So there's places that we know now that are cities and 100 years ago was like a forest. So you can just go and see that in this place before these plants grew here, now they are gone. So it also provides us with this sort of historical record about nature that otherwise we wouldn't have. It's like a time machine. Yeah, <laughs> you just want to go basically, back and yeah. see what it was like then. And now you're finding all of these new species. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm really interested in like how you name them. Do you ever name them after yourself, Dr. Zapata? <laughs> <laughs> so, no. <laughs> um, so the name of the species is actually kind of interesting because um, there is... There are some rules about um, uh, how to name them, but not specifically about the name itself. So mm-hmm. you can use whatever name you want, but there are taxonomic rules about the, the, the way to name them. Scientists all over the world need to be able to talk to each other. To reduce confusion, there's a convention for naming species. This is called taxonomy. Names are usually based in ancient Greek or Latin, and sometimes the local language of the place the species is found. Many species are named something descriptive, like by place or morphology, to help others know what to look for. For example, the coast redwood, Sequoia sempervirens. The word Sequoia is a Cherokee term for leader or chief, while semper means always and virens means green or evergreen. When you put it all together, you get evergreen leader. Isn't that a cool name? So usually uh, I look for different things. So if a species has something very unique morphologically, you can name them based on that, like if it's the color of the flowers or the morphology, or if it's really bizarre, you can name it with something that means that it's bizarre or strange. Mm-hmm. Recently, I named a species honoring big uh, philanthropist from Missouri who gave me some um, money that allowed me to do some research in the tropics. So I named this species honor him uh, in, in, on his honor, but you can do it uh, different ways. I mean, there's no there's no particular rules for, for how to name species. You know, they always say that space is the final frontier. <laughs> maybe understanding nature is the, the final, final frontier. frontier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Biodiversity applies to more than just plants. So we asked Dr. Zapata why he chose to focus on plants in his research. Well, uh, I think that that's, that's um, a tough question to answer for me because to me, plants are the most amazing organisms. So I think that plants are amazing. But if you, if you think about plants, seriously, plants are, um, as I mentioned, they produce the oxygen that we breathe. And they produce the oxygen that not only we humans breathe, but many organisms uh, breathe. So without plants, easily there wouldn't be life on Earth. So plants are these fundamental organisms in nature that um, are the machinery to produce the energy that allows other organisms to to survive. Um, For us humans, plants also provide basically all what we do. Plants are, they provide our food. Most of our food comes from plants. Uh, They support the um, um, development of big cultures. Mm. Uh, Plants provide us with um, fuel, uh, plants provide us with clothing. Plants provide us with with everything, basically. So plants are very linked to to human life and to the development of life on Earth. So I think that plants are key uh, organisms to understand. Now, as we understand more and we are making more discoveries, we are also discovering that microorganisms are key and perhaps is the interaction between plants and microorganisms that led to some of the big um, discoveries and big changes in life on Earth, uh, symbiosis between plants and bacteria or viruses. And so I believe that that's one of the frontiers right now is trying to understand the relationship between microorganisms and, and, and other organisms. Do you have any words of advice for maybe some young evolutionary biologists out there that don't know if this is what they want to do but are curious? And I think that, um, to me, the 
the main advice is, um, I mean, I, I think I have a couple of my advices. The first one is be cur curious and go out in nature. I mean, I think that the key to me is be nature. Nature has so many weird things that we know very little. So go out, see around, look for things. Um, second, it's read and try to go to the sort of the basics and try to understand sort of the fundamental concepts in evolutionary biology. And these days, I would also recommend people to be really uh, good analytically or have really good quantitative basis for uh, data analysis. I think that if you combine passion for nature with theory, and then you're able to analyze data, especially all these huge data sets that are we having these days, you can make really nice contributions to evolutionary biology. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Cool, thanks so much. So the next time you take a stroll through nature, look around and appreciate the millions of years it has taken for that ecosystem to form and thank the plants for the air you breathe. This has been Radio Bio. This episode was brought to you by Lily Pennington and Jackie Shea, produced by Jasper Toscani Field and edited by Lily Pennington, with artwork done by Jackie Shea. Radio Bio is produced by graduate students at the University of California, Merced. Support for Radio Bio comes from the Quantitative and Systems Biology Graduate Group, the School of Natural Sciences, and the Graduate Division at UC Merced. You can help support Radio Bio's mission of increasing scientific literacy in California's Central Valley and beyond by donating at giving.ucmerced.edu slash radiobio. Find out more about our mission, events, and podcasts at www.radiobio.net.